Good morning again, everyone. You're very welcome to Shiloh. Welcome to those again who are watching in on Facebook and on YouTube. A couple of people we just want to pray for before we get into our, our, our message this morning. I'm praying for Sandra and Jimmy's daughter, Kelly. Uh, and Kelly's a nurse and uh, she is really unwell at the moment and we've just been asked to pray for her, but also to pray for Richard and the work that Richard's involved with. Some people probably aren't aware of it. We want to know, ask him. Uh, but uh, we just want to pray for God's protection over his life and the work that he's doing at this time. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, before we turn to your living and active word, which we want you to speak to us through, we ask, Father, please, that you would remember Kelly. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ, you know that she's unwell. You know, Lord God, why she's unwell. And we just pray, Father, please, in the name of Jesus, that you would heal her. We ask, Almighty God, by the authority of Jesus Christ, that she would know the power of God ministering to her, that the Spirit of the living God would fall upon her and that she would be completely healed, that her body, Lord God, would be healed and restored in the name of Jesus. Just draw near to her, Lord, please, and help help them, Lord, over there and uh, to, to just know, Lord God, your presence with them. Father, I just know that there would be anxieties and there will be fears, but nonetheless, you are God, and we just pray that even the family, Father, would know their anxieties disperse because you, O oh God, have Kelly in your hands. Lord, just bless Kelly, please, in Jesus' name. We pray for Richard, Father, very conscious of the work that he's involved with, Lord, and, and it's a spiritual, spiritual battle. And he and, Lord God, others are facing intense pressures, Lord God, at this time, and it's spiritual, Lord. The devil hates his evil works to be exposed, and that's exactly what they're doing. And we ask, Almighty God, please, that you would protect Richard and that you would protect the team, Lord God, around him, the team, Lord God, that he's involved with, and that you would help them, Lord, please, to take a stand uh, for truth and for righteousness and humility, Lord God, in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland at this time. Lord, bless him, guard him, and help him in every way, Father, to draw his, draw his strength from you in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, as we turn to your word this morning, we do ask that you would speak to each of us, Lord, please, and help us, Father, to understand what it is that you're saying to us. Lord, we, we want to hear the voice of God. We want to leave this place with the word of God in our hearts, not my words, Lord. So help us, Father, to have ears to hear what it is that you're saying to us, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking at the issue church membership and what that means and why it's important. And I was actually saying to people this morning, you know, there's nothing in the Bible about church membership, about people having to join. You'll hear me mention that a few times. But, for example, if I hit the deck like a sack of spuds, who's going to take responsibility for this building? Who's going to take responsibility for the land that we owe? You know, in the first early church, there wasn't any of that. They were selling their possessions and, and feeding one another and doing whatever. But times have changed. Not that the church changes, but times have changed. And, you know, we have assets and there's different things. And to make sure that I'm not going to just one day sell it and swan off to Benidorm uh, on the proceeds, we have to have things in place to guard against that. And so membership of a church has an important role, uh, not just for those elements, but that's an important aspect of it as well. Anyway, I was saying last week that the church is where Jesus makes the misfits fit. And no, um, to become a member, put it this way, to become a member of the universal church, remember the universal church is the church of all born again believers through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the universal church. The Apostle Creed calls it the, the, the holy Catholic church. The word Catholic there just means um, universal. And so the universal church, the body of Christ, to be a member of it, uh, of which Jesus is the head, a person must first recognize and acknowledge that they are a sinner, that they are a misfit, that they are a rebel against God, that they need forgiveness of sins, and that they need salvation. And once they recognize this, once they repent and they humbly come to God through faith in Jesus, seeking mercy and grace, they are born again by the Spirit of God, and they are brought into the church, uh, the household or the family of God. So there's the universal church, and then there is the expression of the church in local congregations 
or assemblies of born-again Christians who meet together as a body of like-minded believers, misfits who fit, coming together to worship and to serve the Lord. Remember again, I have to emphasize this point, an unbeliever, an unsaved person who attends church, no matter how religious they might be, no matter how pious and sanctimonious they may be, no matter how up to their neck they are in church governance and administrative responsibilities and whatever else, no matter how holy they might think they are, that person is nothing more than a church goer. And the church church goer isn't saved because church going doesn't save anyone. Now the Bible, as I said, it doesn't explicitly teach that a born-again Christian, a member of the universal church, it doesn't specifically teach that they must join a local church. But there are um, early examples given to us in Acts chapter 2 that we were looking at last week. And that early example is that believers in Jesus, they assemble together as a witness to the gospel of Jesus and the salvation of God. And I was saying this last week, and I was saying that the Bible saying, when you left your home this morning to come here to meet together with other believers in Christ, you are a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have strengthened the witness of the gospel by coming together to meet like this. So meeting together as a local body of believers strengthens the witness of the gospel while strengthening believers in their faith. Believers receive instruction or teaching about God and the things of God. They fellowship with like-minded people participating in and partaking of koinonia. That's the fellowship. They participate in the divine means of grace, which is what one of the, one of the divine means of grace which we participated in this morning is communion. So they participate in the divine means of grace, those opportunities when more grace is poured out into your lives, which helps promote um, spiritual maturity. Uh, they become accountable to those who are accountable for their spiritual well-being. These are just some of the reasons why born-again Christians are encouraged to join a local church. Turn please to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy in the Old Testament chapter 6. And we're going to read the first eight verses. Now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments with the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. So Moses is telling the people of Israel these are the commandments of God that you have to keep. I'll start from verse 1 again. Chapter 6, Deuteronomy. Now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk in the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your, on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And just to confirm what Moses was teaching the people in Matthew, or sorry, in Mark chapter 12, we're just going to hear again what Jesus says. Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 28. He's been having these debates with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then we're told in verse 28, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to Jesus, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all, uh, with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that no one dared to question Jesus. You know in Shiloh we try to give warnings when you're going to get offended. Well, be warned. I am going to make an offensive statement this morning. I'm happy to debate it in the Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, you can come along to that. But I'm going to make an offensive statement, but I'm going to stand by what I say. Any Christian, please hear this, any Christian who jumps from church to church like a spiritual gypsy does not love the church. And therefore, their love for the Lord, the head of the church, is questionable. Hear this again. Any Christian who jumps from church to church like a spiritual gypsy does not love the church and therefore their love for the Lord, the head of the church, is questionable. How many of us know people who became Christians and some of them maybe many years ago and they have spent most of their Christian life jumping from church to church never settling in a church for too long, always making excuses for why they had to leave it. This isn't about people leaving churches for biblical reasons. I have no problem for anybody leaving church for biblical reasons. I have no problem with anybody leaving Shiloh. We are not a cult. There's no chains keeping people to the seats. If people want to leave Shiloh, there's the doors. Bye-bye. We hope that you will go to a church where you will be built up, strengthened, and encouraged in Christ, where you will hear the truth of the gospel preached. But that's not a cult. You can leave at any time you please. So this isn't about saying to people you shouldn't leave a church if you think you're sitting under false teaching. We would even say if you think you're sitting under false teaching, get out of the church. If you are in a church where they don't preach Christ crucified and risen from the dead, that you need to repent of your sins and be born again, get out of the church. This isn't about people leaving for biblical reasons. This is about spiritual nomads who I believe are a danger to themselves and to other young, immature or unstable Christians. They set a terrible, terrible example to others and often their own walk with the Lord is spiritually turbulent. I believe these spiritual gypsies, I was laughing at Linda, she says to me this morning, she says, did you change? She says, did you, did you get like messages telling you off for Darren to use the word gypsy in my advert for Shiloh yesterday? Because she says, you know, it's not really politically correct now, they're called travellers. <laughs> Listen, I couldn't care less what they're called, they're gypsies, right? So, I believe that these spiritual gypsies, these spiritual nomads, I believe they do not love the church. And their love for the Lord, who is the head of the church, is brought into question. And I will explain. If we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, where do you think the born-again Christian would be best placed to express that love? Would it not be in a local church, which is supposed to be uh, a microcosm of the universal church, which is the expression of the universal church? Would it not be in a local church where we would meet together as a body of like-minded misfits who fit to worship the Lord and to serve him from where we extend that worship and service in ministry to the wider community? Well, 
Last Thursday, I celebrated 40 years of being a born-again Christian. I was telling Aidan this morning, you know, when he said congratulations, I said, we'll tell you, Aidan, I didn't even think I would last 40 minutes as a Christian. But last, last Thursday, I celebrated 40 years as a born-again Christian, saved by Jesus on the 4th of July, 1984. And in those 40 years, I have attended five churches, two of which I was or I am currently a member. That's in 40 years. So I first went to Hall Green Methodist Church in Coventry because I had been living in Coventry and when I came back home here on the 4th of July I got saved. I had to go back to Coventry to sort out my life and to sort out my flat before I moved home and so I knew immediately I needed to be among God's people and so I joined Hall Green Methodist Church and I continued there for four months. Then I returned back to Northern Ireland and I attended Rosemary Park Baptist Church and I was there for about a year under the, the preaching and the teaching of Pastor Byers. Uh, and it was wonderful because, you know, I, I knew I was saved and it was just like a sponge soaking everything in that I was hearing. Until John Burroughs, who comes along here, he invited me to come along one day to King's Fellowship Church. So I had been at Rosemary Park Baptist Church for a year and it was wonderful. But John invited me to come along to King's Fellowship. And when I went there, I remained there for the next 11 years under the wonderful, wonderful teaching of John Kelly and Ken Irvine. And that is where I found my grounding in the scriptures through the teaching that I received there. And I thank God for those men. But I left there, having gone away to work in rehabs in different parts of the world and come back, I went to Ken Irvine and I said to Ken, Ken, I'm going to leave Kings here because there's a wee church on Grays Hill called The Basement and they're doing some evangelism stuff and they're looking for people to help them with evangelism. So I'm going to leave here and I'm going to go and help them. And I was with The Basement for three years until, cut it short, make it try as night as possible, threw me, threw me out basically. <laughs> They wanted me to apologize for something and I said hell would freeze. Uh, but anyway, I still we were there for three years and it was wonderful. And out of there was born Shiloh Christian Fellowship. And we have been together now for the past 24 years. So over 40 years, I have sought with the help of the Holy Spirit to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind and strength and to love my neighbor as myself. And the question is, how have I done this? How have I done this? Well, simple. I have done it by joining myself to a local church, to a body of believers, of like-minded people who seek to worship and serve the Lord. And as I've already said, the Bible doesn't explicitly teach that a born-again Christian must pardon me, must join or become a member of a local church. But the early example given is that believers in Jesus assembled together as a witness to the gospel of Jesus as the sal uh, and the salvation of God, demonstrating their love for God and for one another. So here's the question. You heard it in Deuteronomy and you've heard it in Mark from the lips of Jesus himself. What does love for God and love for your neighbor mean to you? It's a really important question. What does love for God and love for your neighbor mean to you? Now, if by love you think I'm talking about nice, fluffy feelings toward God, someone else, or, or towards others, I can assure you I have no fluffy feelings whatsoever for God. I have even less fluffy feelings for any of you. Yet I love God and I love the people of Shiloh Christian Fellowship. So how do born again Christians express their love for God and for others? Without Billy nearly doing my sermon yesterday at the men's breakfast. They do so. Born again Christians express their love for God and others by their commitments. They commit themselves to serve God and their brothers and sisters in Christ. Genuine commitment expresses a person's love. See, if you have you, you Christians, 
See if you have people who are not committed. You question their love for you. You question their love for the church. You question their love for the Lord. For example, a husband and a wife love each other. Hopefully that they do have fluffy feelings towards one another. But their true love is demonstrated by their commitment to each other to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to, to cherish till death us do part. Parents are supposed to love their children and be committed to them until at least they become adults. Brothers and sisters are supposed to love each other because they are committed to one another as a family. And so to the church, the body of born again believers who are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, so too we express our love to the Lord and to each other by our commitment to one another in a local church, which is the expression of our membership to the universal church. See, when you have Christians who come and go and take it or leave it attitude towards church, they're not committed. And therefore, you can't commit yourself to them because they're not committed to you. When God gives them as he does, because the Bible teaches that the Spirit of God gives out individual gifts as he wills to all believers. When the Spirit of God gives him gives them gifts, How can they use those gifts if they're not committed to a local body where they can express those gifts and use those gifts to the glory of God? This is why I believe any Christian who jumps from church to church like a spiritual gypsy doesn't love the church. And therefore their love for the Lord, the head of the church, is questionable because there is no commitment on their part a spiritual nomad a spiritual gypsy who shows no commitment cannot demonstrate their love and so membership of a local church demonstrates a believer's commitment to love first and foremost the lord our god then to love other members of the local body of believers And finally, then, to extend that love to the wider community, to the wider neighbors that we have. Membership of a local church demonstrates a believer's commitment to service, to ministry. Every Christian born again receives the Spirit of God in them. If they haven't got the Spirit of God in them, they are not a Christian. It doesn't matter what they call themselves. But every Christian receives the Spirit of God and he gives every Christian gifts as he wills. But if they are not committed to serve, if they are not committed to ministry, how are they going to use those gifts for the building up of the body of Christ? Because that is what they're given for. They're not given for the individual for themselves. They are given for the body. But if they are not committed to a body or they only come and go when it suits them, nobody's going to see any commitment and therefore no one is going to be committed to them. Membership of a local church demonstrates a believer's responsibility means that they're taking church serious do you remember we said away at the start of this church is at war that we said this is not a game we're not playing church the church is real and we each as individual members of the body of christ have a role a function and a responsibility we also have an accountability unto god you as a born again believer if you are not committed to serving the lord if you are not committed to loving the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself and expressing that within a local body of believers and nobody's going to pay you any heed and you are going to have to give account unto god Because membership of a local church demonstrates that a person is being responsible and that a person recognizes accountability, not just to the leadership of the church, but accountability to God. Sadly, unfortunately, too many Christians jump from church to church like spiritual gypsies, never committing themselves to any local church. And I know many of them. 
I know loads of them and I can guarantee every single one of them with my hand on my heart before God, every one of them that I know has lived a Christian life of spiritual turbulence. They have been up and down like flaming yo-yos their entire Christian life. There has been no plateau of a walk with God. They have been uh, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They've been never able to make up their minds about anything. And even when they do think they hear from God, very often they've got it wrong. Do you think Like I've just said, too many Christians jumping from church to church like spiritual gypsies, never committing themselves to any local church. Do you think that that in any way expresses their love for God or for fellow believers? The answer is no. It doesn't because it can't. Of course born again Christians, and I have to drive this home as well. Of course born again Christians can attend a local church and they can faithfully love and serve there without ever becoming a member. And we're not saying that people here, you must be a member or whatever. There are plenty, there are people in this church who are born again Christians who are more committed than some of the, uh, who are not members who are more committed than what would have been some of our members. Born again Christians can attend a local church they can faithfully love and serve there without ever becoming a member. But very often their lack of commitment means that they may never be able to have any say whatsoever. It will prevent them from having any organizational, administrative or governmental input into that church. So for example in this church how we operate is if we are going to change the structure of the church... If there is something happens in the church that needs to be addressed, we call a special meeting of the members and the members vote on whatever changes take place. Now, those people who come along who are faithful witnesses and faithful servants of the Lord, they can come along and they can input into that meeting, but they have no vote on how things happen. And that's how it can prevent them at times from having that organizational, administrative or governmental input into the church. But maybe they don't want that. But still they're committed and we thank God for them. Born again Christians are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and with all of our strength. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is best demonstrated in our commitment to a local church where together we can worship and serve the Lord. So let me ask you this morning Christian as we move towards this this thing about membership. Are you committed? Your answer can be yes, I'm committed to Shiloh Christian Fellowship, but I'm not going to join, and that's fine. Your answer may be yes, I am committed, and I want to join because I want somewhere down the road to be involved in the, the functioning and uh, governmental, administrative, or organizational input of, of the church. You have to make that decision before God. You have to decide, is this the place best suited for you to express your love for the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind and strength and your love for your neighbours? And I just give that to you, trusting that you will prayerfully consider when we put out the expression of interest for membership of Shiloh. Yes, it's a box-ticking exercise for us as well because of this ridiculous Charities Commission for Northern Ireland. But nonetheless, as I said, somebody has to take control of the hall. Somebody has to manage the assets of the land. Should I pop my clogs uh, and hit the deck like a sack of spuds? Somebody has to do it. If you don't, who will? Because before you know it, the place could turn into the local knee breakers club. (laughs) And I don't want that happening. Maybe this morning there's someone here and you're not yet a born again Christian. Well, maybe perhaps you're a a church-going unbeliever, a person who enjoys church, but you're still not saved. Maybe as an unbeliever, you don't even go to church. But the reality for both an unsaved churchgoer and an unsaved unbeliever, the reality is to die in that condition means to die without Jesus. And without Jesus, no one can see or enter heaven. Is that what you really want? 
Well, all I can say to you this morning is it's time to make a commitment. It is time to confess your sin, to agree with God that you are a misfit, that you are a rebel against God, that you have sinned against a holy God and ask for forgiveness for that sin, to repent from living your life your way and put your trust in Jesus so that you might be saved and that you too can be brought into the universal church and become a committed member of a local church where the word of God is faithfully proclaimed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning as we keep looking at this subject on membership, it's not about, Lord, trying to get numbers for Shiloh. It's about recognizing, Lord, for this work to continue, there has to be some responsibility and some accountability on behalf of those who come here. For the work to continue for years to come. For the assets that you have kindly given to us to be properly stewarded, Lord, and looked after. We need people, Lord, to commit themselves. And yet, Father, even if they commit themselves, something could go wrong and they could choose to willingly walk away and that's up to them. But we look to you, the living God, and we ask you, please, to speak to each of us about whether we are committed or not. Lord, we don't want to be spiritual gypsies, spiritual nomads jumping from church to church. We want to be a people who are grounded, a people who are deeply rooted in Christ Jesus, who express, who express our love for you and our love for one another by our commitment to each other as we serve together as a body of believers in the local church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.